Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to go ahead and hit record, and then we'll get started. Uh, welcome to session nine. This is the ninth session in our series for COVID-19 preparation for biomedical professionals. Today, we're covering a little bit of everything, starting with uh, reuse of PPE. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about electrical safety and autoclaves. Um, again, we're in a phase of this program where we're using all of your questions and all of your comments and feedback from past sessions to create better current sessions um, that are more aligned with exactly what you need right now. Um, so again, we'll launch another poll at the end of this session. You can fill that out, give us more feedback, and we'll continue using that into our next sessions. Like I said, we'll start with the reuse of PPE session. Um, you can hang on to all of your questions until the very end because we'll then move quickly into Guna's didactic on electrical safety and autoclaves. And then at the end, we'll open up for discussion on both topics. If you're new around here, please remember that the foundation of our conversation is love and respect. Please respond kindly rather than react. Please test your equipment ahead of time when you can. You can mute your microphone in the bottom left-hand corner. Remember to unmute your microphone before speaking and also introduce yourself. If you're in a large room, get close to your microphone so we can hear you. And if you have any issues at all, you can chat us here or you can email us at assisthtm at assistinternational.org. So I wanted to give you a brief summary of a session done by N95 Econ Consortium. Um, they did this for clinical users. They did it a couple weeks ago now for um, those clinicians at the same time as our Africa slide or our session. Um, you can go see the whole session. It's very good. It's very detailed. Um, I'm going to give you a quick 10 to 15 minute um, summary of it just to let you know what it's about um, and give you a little bit of information. You can visit their website here at 95decon.org and you can also view their full session of this YouTube link. Once you get the slides, you'll be able to access those. So the whole session was about reusing N95 masks or surgical masks. Um, the factors that they looked at to evaluate whether a processing technique was effective or ineffective are first filtration efficiency, second fit test, third bio burden reduction, and fourth hazards. Filtration efficiency is how well the mask continues to filter particles. Fit test is how well it fits around your face after processing. Bio burden reduction is the elimination of the actual virus itself. Does it kill it? Does it um, dismantle it? Um, does it otherwise make sure it's not harmful to you? And lastly, it's hazards. Um, some techniques can introduce health hazards. For example, if you soak a mask in bleach, and then put it over your mouth, it's a lot like breathing bleach. So those are the kinds of things they want to avoid. So just a quick refresher, PPE is kind of the last layer of protection. Um, ideally, you're able to avoid protection. See at the top of the triangle here, the most effective way is to just not come in contact with the virus at all. Some others are changing the way you work so that you're, for example, if you're not needed in a patient room, you don't go into the patient room, um, or if you can disinfect the machine ahead of time and bring it out of the room. Those are the kinds of things that are ideal, but as a last resort, if you're, a, if you're a clinician that needs to go into a patient room and contact a patient that has something like COVID, um, PPE is your sort of last resort. Um, depending on your contact with both viruses and people and um, other contaminants, you need different levels of PPE. Um, for example, if you're doing a surgery that requires an aerosol generating procedure, you're at your highest risk, so you should be wearing the most protection. Um, if you have direct contact with COVID patients, it's similar. You don't necessarily need an N95 mask. Um, all of the rest are recommended. Um, biomedical technicians, depending on your um, organization, your job structure, exactly what you're doing, you probably fall somewhere between these two things. You may be in direct contact, not with COVID patients, but with equipment that's been used on COVID patients, um, and you may be participating in some aerosol generating procedures. 
So now the question is this, what if your access to PPE is limited? Um, a lot of our friends in Cambodia and Myanmar and other places in both Africa and Asia don't have um, either the budgets or the access to PPE. And this is especially true for biomedical technicians. Clinicians sort of get priority, especially because they come in contact with COVID designated patients. Um, but by coming into contact with the equipment used on them, you're at just as high a risk. Um, so we wanna make sure you're protected. If your access to PPE is limited, there are some things you can do rather than just buying you know, extra PPE. First is extended use. Uh, particularly for clinicians, instead of switching between patients, you can actually switch after entire shifts. Um, it's not ideal, but as long as you're careful not to um, don and doff improperly, and you're careful not to come in contact with you know, non-COVID related patients, um, you should be relatively safe just extending the use. Um, number two is decontamination and reuse. This is again, not as good as replacing each time, um, but it can be done and we'll talk to you about some of the methods for decontaminating. Um, and lastly is substitution. For example, if you don't have an N95 filtration mask, you can substitute with say a surgical mask. It doesn't have the same level of particle protection, but it's still fairly good. Um, also, if you don't have gloves, you can substitute by extra hand washing. Um, and if you don't have an actual face shield or goggles, you can actually make your own out of different plastics. Um, so there are some options like that. This is the same list on that very first slide. When you're looking at decontamination, you have to first preserve the filtration of particles. Um, that's the reason why you're wearing a mask. You second have to preserve the fit around your mouth and nose. Um, that makes sure that the mask is still effective. Three, you actually have to kill the virus or pathogen. Um, and four, you can't introduce additional hazards. It's not worth harming your lungs with bleach um, just to prevent virus. It's just not ideal. The methods that are not effective, um, these either damage the N95 filtration, so the actual passage of particles through, or it doesn't inactivate the virus. So on the left-hand side, you see soap, alcohol, bleach immersion, and gamma radiation. Um, these have all been tested and found to be ineffective because they actually damage the mask itself. On the right, you see things that don't actually inactivate the virus. Um, storing masks overnight is not long enough. UVA and B do not actually work. You need UVC rays. And then also sunlight doesn't have the UVC that you need. Just a point of note, do not bring your masks home if you can help it. Um, decontamination should occur at the hospital in secure environments. Okay, so there are four methods that are effective. The first two are on this slide and the second two are on the next. So number one is vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Um, if you want details for how to actually do this, you can go to the N95 decon page um, and they'll give you a little bit more details. In summary, vaporized hydrogen peroxide is effective as long as your mask doesn't contain cellulose. Um, hydrogen peroxide is great for deactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that's specifically the COVID-19 virus, um, and this can be used about 10 to 20 times on the same mask without harming the mask. Um, it just depends on the brand and the make. Um, they've tested on some very specific brands, makes, and models. Um, so you can also check out those details on their website. Um, second method is ultraviolet C, UVC. Um, there's a very specific range of wavelengths that are actually germicidal. Um, so it's kind of beyond sunlight, beyond UVA and B. Um, you hit v UVC and that's where the rays actually are small enough to um, basically dismantle the virus. There is some concern that it doesn't penetrate to the deepest layers of the masks. Um, but it, like the other one, can be used up to 20 cycles, um, as long as you know that the fit is still the same. In some cases, that was damaged after about five cycles. Uh, UVZ can actually harm the straps more so than the mask. Um, and so once the straps are broken, it's no longer an effective mask. So you should be mindful of that. Um, if you want more information on dosage, that is also on the N95 website. Um, if you've ever seen a UV lamp in, say, like a salon, um, sort of a tanning bed, 
just know that those are not UVC lamps. They're either UVA or UVB. Um, UVC is much stronger. It can actually cause a lot of skin damage and eye damage. Um, and also if it's set too high, it can produce ozone, which can be harmful. Um, so you should be cautious when using this method, but it is very effective. Okay, methods three and four. Number three is humid heat. Um, a lot of you are gonna be more familiar with autoclaving. It's the same process. This is how we decontaminate a lot of things outside of masks. Um, just know that the standard settings for your autoclave are actually going to damage your mask. They're a bit too hot and a bit too humid. Um, so what they've done is given us these three settings. Um, so if you can set your autoclave to about 70 to 85 degrees Celsius, um, at a relative humidity of 50 to 85 percent and a target time of at least one hour, you should be good to go. This is not as effective for as long. Um, this tends to damage the mask well before you hit 20 cycles and they're saying about five. Again, this depends on which mask you're using, but up to five you should be okay. The very last method is a last resort. Um, this is not recommended very often, um, but if you have no access to anything, no UVC lamps, no humid heat, um, no autoclaves, nothing, you can wait about a week and then reuse your mask. Um, please make sure you're storing it in a breathable container, something that's sealed tightly will not work. That will actually preserve the virus a bit longer. Um, but if it's in a breathable container for at least seven days, preferably more, um, this is expected to significantly reduce risk of exposure. You should remember that the outer surfaces are likely still contaminated, um, and there's insufficient data to actually confirm exactly how long you need to wait before reusing your mask. Um, but at least give it seven days, 14 if you can. Um, use this method only if you have no other option. And make sure everything is clearly labeled because at least uh, just one night is not enough. Um, that is all I have for the summary. Again, we can answer some questions in the end about hand raise, but we'll get to you um, in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Puma for electrical safety. Hi, good morning, everyone. So we're going to talk about um, electrical safety. This is one of the important part when you deal with medical equipment. So what is electrical shock? And uh, I think we spoke about this so many times during the training, all that. But at the same time, uh, electric current that passing through human body that can cause major or minor injury, even that. So, you have always remember it's quite dangerous. So normally, um, voltage can be 220, 110, depends on the country. So when you get a contact of voltage of 220 or 110, you get let, you're going to experience electric shock. So this is uh, basic things that you need to know. Most of your uh, electrical connection, always remember that's uh, if three phase, they got line one, line two, line three, neutral and earth. So the neutral, we call it cold wire, connect to the earth. These are a proper one. Some places there's an issue without the earth as well. So class one, normally you are referring to the earth. Class one medical device, normally what happens is they have earth lines. So what uh, the, all the leakage current going to go through that particular ground line. So it's quite safe. If anything goes wrong, you're going to get uh, contact with this particular point. The ground going to be safe. And at the same time, your circuit breaker or fuse is going to open immediately due to the ground line. So what happens if the particular circuit, uh, the ground is broken or doesn't have ground? So if you are going to be in contact, 
basic basically you're going to be the a ground light because uh, you will be the one of the less resistant point to go through so you're going to get electrocuted eventually uh, your circuit breaker or fuse not going to blow but you're going to be the circuit so leakage current some equipment if uh, any life line broken or anything is going to hit touch the chassis for example autoclave uh, autoclave line equipment is metal casing so if lifeline broken or anything is going to touch the particular metal casing and going to en energize certain electric but if you got ground line it's going to trip the main line if not it's going to uh, cause some injury someone who going to touch going to get electrocuted so current normally we, uh, we refer as a leakage current in the circuit on or on the equipment so uh, normally the current need to be it can be usually smaller uh, value like 500 micro amp or something like that so that can cause a lot of issue if uh, your wiring is not good it can cause damage and injury so when you talk about grounding grounding play very important role so in case you got a flaw uh, faulty equipment anything that will trip the particular uh, circuit breaker or blow the fuse so this is going to give a better part for ground ground wire is normally we're going to drain the leakage current and uh, it's going to go through that particular line so it's always looking for a lower resistance so if your ground line is good the leakage current is going to be going through that particular ground cable and your equipment is safe to touch and always remember there's two different type of electric shock one is macro shock another one is micro shock so both depends on the path of the current and point of entry so when you talk about macro shock that current that flow through your body but not directly contact to your heart these are when you talk about macro shock normally what you daily involvement like when you do wiring you get electric electric heated all that that's considered as a macro shock and current that go through exit more than 10 milliampere so that's my macro shock for for example you are fixing washing machine in the hospital but your grounding is not good the current going going to intend go through your body because you are touching but if your grounding is good it's going to trip the particular circuit breaker all that so it's always remember grounding is very important micro shock is the other way around that uh, it's always uh, uh is going to go through the patient and direct electric to the heart usually is unrelated to macro shock so micro shock generally uh, results from a leakage current that voltage between the ground all that that uh, not working properly but it's going to go through your body and uh this will cause micro shock so if you see micro shock the point of entry and is going to go to your heart and to the ground line for example you can be pacing ecg all this pacing wire all this can cause micro shock all the medical equipment so this is an example like faulty equipment you can see a faulty equipment without the ground so that particular equipment leakage current going to find a part of a a ground point so that going to go through a, another equipment like patient monitor is going to go through for example ESC or something like that the ground is not working properly is going to find for that particular part 
So always remember fixing the ground, all this. So talking about standard, when you talk about medical device and lab device, there's standard that you need to follow. For example, IEC 60601. Then for US, you got AMI, AMI. And uh, IEC 62353, these are for service purpose. 60601 is more on uh, medical equipment manufacturers. They're going to use that particular standard. And uh, at the same time, you can use 60601 to do your electrical safety test. So uh, common uh, definitions that you use in IC6001, 62353 is like EUT, equipment under test, device under test, and apply part, apply part is like your ECG, NIBP, SPO2, all these are apply part, patient connection, that um, things that are related to apply part, like direct contact to your body. F-type apply part is electrical isolated from the ground, other part of med medical equipment like floating. So for example, BF or type CF, apply part that been isolated. Class one and class two device. So class one, normally you are re referring to your ground. Class two is double insulated, always remember. Uh, it have a double layer of insula insulation for safety. Class one always referring to the ground. So when you talk about class two device, if, if there's an intention of the ground, you can get a three pin connect connector, but it doesn't have necessary to do the test because it doesn't have ground. Even though it's connected to do testing, but it doesn't work as a ground unit. Then type B, BF, and CF, uh, you got type B that referring, equipment that referring to ground. This I apply part, type B, BF, and CF. Type BF is a F type apply part that uh, have certain ex extent of safety. And uh, type CF apply part that suitable direct cardiac application is F type as well and uh, highest degree of protection against electric shock compared to type B and type BF. So this is the checklist that normally you're going to use uh, during uh, doing the safety test. These are according to the IC60601 and certain tests are optional, like for example, insulation tests, all that. But when you doing as electrical safety, you need to comply with a leakage current, enclosure leakage, patient leakage current for apply part. So lead to a leakage current, then lead to lead leakage current, then lead to isolation or MAP main on apply part. All these are for apply part like ECG, all that. So you can see the single fault condition, normal condition, all this are, are practiced on the safety analyzer. So this sample class one device, we're going to choose according to IC6061 test. So when you connect the ground line, all that, you have to connect the equipment with the grounding. So image two going to show all the testing part of it. So you can see the grounding, like voltage measurement, the image two, and image three is the device current. And you can see on the, the light, two green lights on the screen on image two, that is, telling you the connection, connection of the wiring on your plug point, is it correct wiring or not? You can see if correct wiring going to have two green light. If reverse is going to show reverse, uh, the light will indicate a reverse condition. 
An open ground is going to only indicate one light. Open hot, there's no light at all. Open neutral, there will be like on indicate on reverse and the other other part of OK, but there's a missing light. And odd ground reverse is going to show the same thing. So this is going to indicate your wiring is good condition or not. If you are grounded, all that is going to show you correct wiring. So always remember that for this particular analyzer. So the earth resistant tests, these are class one tests. So you're going to test uh, the grounding tests, the, the set and the set value according to IC standard should be somewhere 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. So it's 0 0.09 there, the reading on the photo. That means the reading is inside the range. And always remember when you talk about class two device, you don't do this particular test. Then you do earth leakage or ground leakage. Uh, tests. These are going to test the leakage current from this particular uh, earth line, all that. So what happens is the, the, the safety analyzer is going to show open ground and it's going to measure normal condition, should be less than 500 micro m in normal condition. And open neutral should be less than 1000 on single fault condition. And reverse condition should be less than 1,000 micro ampere as well, single fault, and normal condition should be less than 500 single fault. So what's a normal condition and single fault condition? Normal condition is your live neutral and ground is connected properly. And single fault, normally there'll be like, uh, re by removing that neutral, what's the outcome of the reading? So that's what you measure actually. So these are only tests for class one device. If the equipment doesn't have ground, you cannot do this particular test. Earth leakage or ground leakage. Then enclosure leakage. Enclosure leakage is almost similar. You need to do single fault and normal condition. So you are, you're going to measure the uh, flowing to the ground, the current flowing to the ground by touching the medical equipment, like a certain part of the medical equipment. So you are checking whether there's a leakage on the touching point. So that's what you're doing. So these are one of the important part some device, it doesn't have any apply part, but like patient monitor, all that, you got apply part. So when you talk about apply part device, that uh, you're talking about like ECG, all that, that current fold uh, going through that particular point and going to the ground. So you're going to measure whether there's a leakage on that particular apply part. So with a low, current low as 15 micro M, can result fatality, uh, fatal. So these are things that you need to know because as a patient, what happens is they, they're going to sweat all this. So it's going to be dangerous. So when you talk about patient leakage or uh, current, always we're going to test patient leakage and lead to earth leakage. So lead to earth leakage is you're checking the ECG lead you can see the example of the connection. So the measurement is uh, the lead are referring to, to the earth and you are checking whether the lead have any leakage. So the measurement for normal condition is 10 for CF, 100 to BF, for BF and B, and it's, it should be in micro M. Open should be somewhere 50 side. Uh, for CF and 500 for BF micro M. 
So these are the current that you should measure should be less than this on normal condition and single fault condition. And you need to set the test for all so you can check what's the total leakage current from your uh, air plug part. And you can, uh, if you see the leakage current is high, you can check one by one to check which one have more leakage. So you're grouping them as one. So lead to lead tests are almost similar, but what you're doing is you are referring lead one to lead two, lead one to lead three, something like that. So you are measuring individually on this test. Even this test should be individual tests. So the normal condition value is there and I apply part. This particular value are according to the IEC standard. So these are a standard value. So you are talking, uh, checking between the aux auxiliary current that you are sensing the circuit, all that. You are checking whether any leakage between the leads. Uh, main on apply parts, MAP, uh, lead isolation test. This will be a bit dangerous test normally because you are talk, uh, doing contact on the leads between the, one of the leads with the uh, voltage, line voltage. So you are referring whether there's a, when one of the parts got uh, apply part, what uh, line voltage touch and you are checking whether the remaining apply part have higher leakage or not. So normally on the normal condition and reverse condition, the lead should be less than 50 for CF and 500 for BF and B on micro amp. So you are checking whether there's a leakage. You can see there's a reading of 24 micro amps that means leakage is below the 50s, 50 or 500. So if you're, you get leakage above this particular reading, above 50 or 500, you need to check the isolation circuit inside the medical device. Sometimes maybe it fails. So now we're going to talk about autoclave. So everyone know the principle of autoclave when water heat in the closed container and steam, you're going to produce a pressure when you block, um, the container is locked and all that, you're going to get steam and pressure. So these are one of the important things that you normally use in hospital to sterilize all the equipment, all that. So purpose of autoclave, normally you're going to use for lab, laboratory equipment, material, surgical tools, all that. Then uh, your ventilator, tubing, pipette, all this to sterilize and uh, keep it clean. So this is the purpose of autoclave. Type of autoclave, you got gravity method, so gravity method is a horizontal and down displacement. So you normally use for biohazard, glassware, unwrap goods, all that. And vacuum, uh, wrap loads, all this, and prepack goods, all that. Liquid is water, saline, agar method. So these are three type autoclip normally you're going to use. So when you talk about horizontal or gravity type, so you use a cold water, escape through bottom of chamber, steam, and dis display above. The valve should never obstruct the chamber, must be overfilled in order the system function. So normally you cannot overfill the particular chamber. That can cause system not 
uh, have some issue all that. So this is how it works horizontal. So it's used electrical operation and you can uh, have fully automated or semi-automated, depends on the brand that, that you buy. So downward displacement autoclave is well known as a gravity displacement. It's used gravity to support for the movement. So it's using a heating element, heat up the water to, to produce the steam. And uh, steam that move around, which lighter than the air, force the air inside the sterilized chamber to move downward. Eventually the air move out through the drain of the whole sterilizer. And the, once the temperature in the chamber is sufficient, the hole is automatically closed and sterilized process start. So basically this will create, the chamber will create certain pressure and is going to sterilize the equipment and all that. So vacuum assist autoclave. Uh, it's almost similar, but using a negative pressure displacement. So what happens is the vacuum going to pump and remove air from the sterilized chamber and the, and the steam is created in, in the chamber. Steam are sent to the chamber of the unit and the process begin. So the vacuum will remove all the air and then we'll send a pulse of steam. So this type of auto, auto cliff is suitable like instrument, all that. So it's using a method of clearing the vacuum air from the chamber and sending the steam into the chamber. So vacuum as is normally things that involve is like eating element, Temperature control, pressure sensor, chamber, door gasket, solenoid valve, water level sensor, steam generator, vacuum pump. So this number eight and number nine, steam generator and vacuum pump, most of the issues that you're going to get is this particular two things. Uh, vacuum pump doesn't work properly, so eventually what happens is you get wet wet equipment and all this. So always keep things checked. So vacuum assist or pre-vacuum autoclave. So air rapidly from the sterilized chamber begin. So you remove the air from the chamber and uh, it begin cycle to create vacuum. So steam sent to penetrate inside the chamber very rapidly. Then a second vacuum cycle to withdraw the moisture after sterilization. Then to make sure that load been dry, all that. So first step, there will be a vacuum. Then they will send a steam after that particular sterilization process finish is going to vacuum again. So these are normally, uh, this particular vacuum assist type autoclave, normally they use, connect with the centralized oiling system, steam, so have larger capacity and fully automated and fail safe. And use modern computerized system that anything goes wrong can be about if any malfunction, all that. So they use uh, like PLC, all that, and it'd be a huge system normally. Vertical pressure, pressure cooker, autoclave, normally you use like a household thing that you use uh, similar like cooker, commonly used in practice. Vertical pressure cooker as air vent and top, which manually close after air has been evacuated. 
So, so possible disadvantage of some air may remain and trap and the steam and can cause low, co low temperature to reach on certain area. And these are manually operate sterilized. Human error can influence of the sterilization process. So there's no automatic drying cycle. So the item maybe can be slightly damp or wet. So ensure you always have to make sure it dry before you use it. Then classification of autoclave type of sterilization cycle like type N, type B. So when you talk about type N downward displacement, your suitable process is for unwrap solid instrument for immediate use. Uh, type B vacuum, B type unwrap, wrap solid hollow instrument, pro slot, example wrapper, gown, all that. And uh, used by dentist, plastic surgery, surgery, day surgery. So the B type is most of the time being used. N type, a quick process. That's that's the difference. So between class B versus class N, class B sterilized autoclave with vacuum pump, pre-vacuum for cold air, remove and post-vacuum for odd hair and removal venting. So a lot of a vacuum process, provide better penetration and sterilization for wrap, holo, frost instrument, all that. So it, it have a better penetration of sterilization. Short sterilization time, short drying time, faster total cycle. And class N, no vacuum function, air removal performed by gravitational displacement, drying performance, by compress and natural vending, longer sterilization process, longer drying time requirement. When you talk about autoclave, always remember things that play very minimum effective role is you need to have pressure, uh, right temperature and time. These three will make sure your sterilization process work properly. If you don't, have, don't achieve one of these, you don't get a proper sterilization process. Precaution for autoclave user and BMAT. So always remember use eye protection, lab coat, all this, and uh, close to shoe, do not use slippers, all that, and use head resistant glove, all this. So these are to make sure you are you are protected up and use a proper PPE for safety reasons. So preventive maintenance. Always remember clean all the filter, usually uh, water and air. And uh, fill the water level and feed the tank by using uh, up to maximum limit by using distilled water. Always use distilled water for your autoclave. Check the manometer function except using by using the digital pressure meter. Check accuracy of temperature reading. You can use digital pressure meter uh, DPM by using the temperature uh, probe. You can uh, active the safety valve manually, but you have to be careful. You can release steam when uh, running on the process. So you're pulling the safety valve, you're checking whether the safety, safety valve is in good condition or not. So conduct a general process, write down the pressure, temperature, requirement time, all that cycle, and uh, check whether it's inside the specification or not. Verify the function C is inside the tolerance. Refer to the service manual. Check any abnormal sound on the solenoid. When uh, there's a change of uh, solenoid uh, switching, you can hear 
the sound whether it's normal or something else wrong. Clean the chamber for removal lime scale, if any. Always try to use distilled water. Always use distilled water so you don't get lime scale. Check the leakage current, earth leakage current, and check the protective earth by using safety analyzer or multimeter. So this is the things that you are checking whether is the electrical safety is there or not. So preventive maintenance, lime scale, normally when you try to use normal water, all that is going to create a deposit that you found on the eating element, hot water boiler, all that. So that can cause a damage on the eating element. So the chamber need to be clean with uh, scrapping the, the scale with the normal kitchen thing and uh, clean by using the steel wood, a light one. Be careful when you're cleaning. So you, you need to see the eating element, any leakage or not. Because sometimes when the eating element start, the metal part start to leak, you're going to get circuit breaker issue and some short, all that. And use plenty of water to clean. Because if you got a remaining lime scale inside the system, it's going to create more and more eventually. So autoclave performance, you can use quality assurance, like um, do the physical check, control the parameter like temperature and time. And uh, use heat sensitivity tape and check the before and after tests. And uh, by using the biological test, sterilizing a strip, you can uh, see whether it sterilized properly or not. So these are method to check the quality assurance of your autoclave. Right, thank you. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move into discussion now. Um, I'm also going to launch the poll. If you can go ahead and fill that out, that will give us a good sense of um, how valuable this is to you, if there are other topics you'd like us to cover. Um, anything you want us to know, you can also drop a note in the chat, and we'll be happy to address it. And now I think we're ready to open things up to questions. I don't see any in the chat, so I'll just pause here um, if you have questions. I know there was a raised hand earlier. Um, feel free to reach out. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Um, oh, there's a question. Okay, how do we know the ground pole and wire are suitable with current power supply used? Uh, who asked this question actually? Can I, how, to, how do we know the ground pole and wire are suitable with the current power supply we use? Uh, so what type of... Uh, this is my question, Guna. Come on, uh, in Cambodia, you are using 220 volt. Yeah. And uh, the, the, your ground... 
the thing is, sorry, the thing is, I asked because I did the the power groundings with the team before, uh -huh. and I was I was curious at that time why do we because because some hospitals they use different uh, sometimes there's different supplies of uh, power, but okay. but in general like two two hundred twenty is uh -huh. is like is like the max power supply that we use, right? Yep, in Cambodia, yeah. So there, 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 there might be like the general recommended uh, yeah. ground poles and wire to be connected to that. Okay, if we are if we are talking about from three phase, you need to have a ground line as well, or single mm -hmm. phase. You still have to use ground. You you know right how they do the grounding right with with the rod all that. Yeah. and uh, salt all that to make sure that it absorb the salt work very well with the copper the salt yeah they use salt sometimes and uh, oh. charcoal and then they they try to bury it with the particular thing so that's a it absorb properly okay. if your ground ground area is too too dry what happens is there there'll be no a proper contact. So that's the reason they intend to use salt and charcoal and soil. Oh. Yep, that's how you do the ground method. So eventually what happens is uh, by doing this, you need to put some water, all that. So eventually start to absorb all that. But normally you can do any grounding, but you have to see the deep potential difference between the ground line and uh, neutral you have to see whether uh, what's the voltage normally it should be less than 0 0.3 volt when you measure mm -hmm. by using meter between the ground and neutral okay and between the okay. ground and uh, life should be somewhere 220. Got it. okay so that's how you may check whether your grounding is good or not got it does okay. grounding change then whenever you move to somewhere like the U.S. that runs a 110 power? Or is it the same process and the same material? It's the it's, it's same process, but uh, sometimes what happens is they intend to use extra precaution, like uh, isolation and all that. So if you're talking about isolation transformer for hospital, there'll be a floating ground. It's a different method of doing, but you still use a ground line. To float them. Okay, got it. I can send you more detail on this, but this this a method that they use. You have to do a proper grounding. So what happens is your equipment got any leakage, it's going to channel to the ground. So if your neutral neutral fail, your ground still going to help to trip the circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. All, yeah. And the fuse. It's a protection actually. Double protection. Neutral fail, ground is there. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Kuna. Welcome. Okay. Um, looks like it's just about nine o'clock for you guys. So we're going to go ahead and end the recording. Um, thank you so much for your participation. Thanks for coming here every week and participating with us. We really appreciate it. We also very much appreciate your feedback. Um, if you would choose different topics, if you would like to hear something again, please let us know. Um, you can either email us or chat us here. And last thing, I'm going to leave the link to the ASSIST website in the chat. Um, that's where you can find all of the past sessions and all the PowerPoints. Um, this one will be uploaded in about 24 to 48 hours, um, depending on how much work our team has. Um, and then you'll get the reminder in your email. So with that, I will let you guys go. Please have a good day and stay safe out there. And thanks again. <laughs>